so in the webinar today, uh, we'll be talking about the building blocks for data metrics. And um, if we look at today's agenda, first I'll spend five minutes talking about why this is important, why we need to think about making data count. And then Christian will take over and he will talk about the Make Data Count project and what data site built within that project. And Robin will give a summary of what that actually means for you. What do we now have available that you can use? And Martin will tell you where we go from here. So what the next steps are. And of course, we really welcome your input. And then, as I said, we'll have some time for Q&A. So in case you're wondering why we're talking about Make Data Count all the time, that is because Make Data Count was a project. And it was a project that set out to build the social and technical infrastructure necessary to start developing data metrics. It was funded by the Sloan Foundation and it ran from May 2017 until now. And that's also the reason why we're doing this webinar now. Because I think some of you have been wondering what um, will happen after Make Data Count. And I really want to assure you that we're continuing that work. All three partners, DataSite, CDL and DataOne, are very committed to continuing the work that we started uh, within Make Data Count. And DataSite will also continue to host the infrastructure. And that's why we wanted to show you today what that infrastructure is and what you can work on with us. So why do we need to make data count? Why is it so important to be thinking about this? Um, and I think there are many uh, images and figures I could be showing here, but actually yesterday I saw a presentation uh, about the European Open Science Monitor and that's why I picked this image. Because um, they did a survey and that showed that um, most researchers think it's very important to have access to research data and that it would benefit their research. That's the first uh, bar you see there. But then they also say, that sharing research data is not really associated with credit or reward in their field. So only around 40% thinks there's credit or reward associated with sharing data. And we can't really um, start addressing that unless there are some indicators um, for the impact of data. And before Make Data Count, there was another project called Making Data Count that already started doing work on this and looking at what um, indicators we could look at. Um, and what came out of that was that citations, data citations were seen as most important, but other options would be downloads or links or views of landing pages. And now you may think, but I, sometimes I already come across views and downloads and citations, so don't we already have some of that? And I think what's different here from existing efforts is that these were often individual efforts. And the numbers you see don't mean the same thing. And if you're comparing apples to oranges, you can't really start using those numbers. And that's why it's very important that we develop a standardized way to start looking at these things so that we can compare and we can start to assign meaning to these numbers. Um, and so that's what we wanted to do within the Make Data Count project. So this is basically the structure of the Make Data Count project. And uh, we realized that data citations were a really important part, uh, but some work had already been done on that in the context of the Research Data Alliance. So we decided to leverage existing initiatives and incorporate that into the hub we were working on. But for usage metrics, so for views and downloads, there wasn't any kind of standard. So we developed a new recommendation together with Project Counter so that repositories could feed standardized information about views and downloads into this hub. Um, and that would then give us a way to bring all of that together, uh, of course, in an open way so that everyone can then extract that information and start displaying that information. And so today we want to show you what that means, what we build and what we have available. So Christian will now tell you more about that. Thank you, Elena. Uh, and I think, I think you can see my screen. So uh, yeah, practically in this part of the presentation, I would like to talk about uh, what we actually have been building to make data count. And 
I'm going to start something uh, not with infrastructure, but something that we uh, uh, help uh, to co out for and actually we're driving to a certain degree. And that's as Elena Lekwete put it, uh, the counterproductive practice, which is this standard of how uh, this usage uh, data should be processed and how it should be reported. We, we actually created this standard together with the partners in the Metadata Account Meta Project and co it in close collaboration with the counter. Uh, one year ago, exactly, actually, there was not yet uh, the, the case of research data was not well ever supported within the counter standard. But after we did uh, the first draft of this counter standard, we, we moved forward that uh, uh, ball to actually make it that we have a standard of how to count and report and process of usage data. Earlier this year, actually, we released the, the version number one of this uh, code of practice for such data, and practically you can find it in the counter website. The reason why there, are, well, I mean, as Elena put it, like we need a standard way to actually count uh, usage for, for data. And it is different to count it for data that is for text uh, documents and other type of resources that actually counter was already standardized. And the differences are mostly because we have different use cases when it comes to data. There is, for example, no need to track access to it by institutions as most research data is available. We also have difference about granularity. Data sets frequently indivi include individual files and sometimes they're aggregated and can be merged and split. We also have differences in versions. Research data frequently have many versions. That's not something that you don't have with documents, for example, or publications. And probably the most, uh, one of the most important differences is that we have non-human users of data. Sometimes there are scripts of automated tools that frequently use and fetch research data. And previous counter uh, specifications will actually filter those ones and will not count them. But for, the, for research data, we have to do an exception of that. The counter core practice actually, uh, you could probably divide it uh, in the case of research data in two parts. The first part is about processing the usage data and this comes in the, in the shape of logs. And in this part of the counter core practice, uh, you will find sections that will tell you what's the minimum information that your logs need to have in order to actually you process them and, and, and extract this uh, usage information. It will also tell you how to filter different things. For example, what, what should you do when you have double clicks by, an author, by a, a user in your repository and how should that be counted and how, to, how should that be dealt with? Um, there are also filters for, uh, for robots that are useful. I mean, uh, non-human non uh, users that you would like to keep and some ones that you want to actually exclude. And it tells you actually how to go about, how to differentiate those ones naturally provides lists about, list about this. And also it helps you actually to deal with another variables like volume was uh, that is regarding about the size of the, of the data, the data sets that you have in the repository. And if, what does it mean to actually, the difference between the load uh, data set that is like one kilobyte against a data set that is like one megabyte of a one gigabyte. The second part of the code of common practice actually deals with the reporting, or I'm going to use the term sharing these usage metrics, but in just for the sake of this presentation, I will use the term sharing, but it's also about reporting. And this part of the, the code of practice actually has you to identify the different types of uh, what we call metric types, uh, which actually is divided in two, in two big categories that in, in a human language translator will be something I say, uh, what is a view? view in a file, but view in a data research data set and view and download in a research data set. What's the difference between those two? Also, uh, how to, um, what, what are the different access methods to those data sets and how do you differentiate those ones when you are counting and aggregating? There is also, there is also exists the concept of sessions. This is how long would you count, for example, a user to be working within the same session and saying like, well, this single user download this data set X amount of times, or view it only one time and not more. And, and that's part of actually the, the, of the specification of the counter code practice. One final part actually, it also tells you the format and the protocol that you should be using to actually share this uh, usage data. 
Um, this uh, specification is called SUSHI, which is just uh, the initials of Standardized Usage Statistics Harvest Initiative Protocol. And, and this is the protocol that we use, the format that we use actually to exchange uh, in a standard way uh, usage data about usage data. Once you have read the whole uh, counterpart of practice, uh, you are practically ready to actually implement it. And actually, here's when the part, where the part about infrastructure comes about. There are, there are uh, I would say, four steps in the infrastructure that you build to make your account. The first one is processing usage logs, which is mostly the bulk of the code of practice, how to implement the implementation about that. The second part is about sharing those usage logs and that uh, does usage data and that's the second part that I showed you about the code practice. And there are two additional parts, which actually are about consuming those uh, usage data and actually about displaying it. And, this also, and we have been doing work and built infrastructure in each of those areas. So what I'm going to do in the next steps is just showing you the different types of places infrastructure we have built uh, to give you a, an insight of this. The first part is about usage processing and infrastructure. And the first thing that I want to say here is that rather than uh, the said that we have built an application for actually do this, what I want to say is that there are six institutions already, six, uh, six repositories and well, six, six organizations that actually have implemented the code of practice and built an implementation to process uh, usage logs according to the uh, code of practice. That is Dryad, Dataverse, Zenodo, Data One, CDL, and DataSight. All of them have implemented uh, um, a piece of software that actually processes logs. They are slightly different implementations, but though all of them, each of each one of them, will uh, follow the code of practice. And what we, what every organization, is, every repository out there is expected is actually take the code of practice, actually do their own implementation, or actually take far, by example any of the implementations of these other repositories. I can tell you that Dryad and CDL have a very similar implementation. It has open source, it's an open source implementation that Dataverse and Zenodo have actually used to actually create an implementation. DataSight is also has created an implementation of, of the, the log processing and we will make it, make it available soon for everybody to use it as an open source kind of solution. The next, the next thing that we build in terms of infrastructure, um, is for sharing usage reports. And here, um, I'm pretty sure that probably many of you uh, the working in data repositories have seen this cartoon. And, and practically, I think here, data set is flipping the table in data repositories and asking what you have probably asked many times to all your users that shared your data. So now what we're asking is like, it's your turn to share your usage data with us. I guess data site is now the, the data repository for usage data. And to help you with that, uh, we have created um, an API that lives in data site and in the data site event data service. And this API um, uh, is, is used to actually share usage reports. Any repository out there which has DOIs in the resources can actually share reports in this API and we will be accepting them and making, us making them available to everybody. So once you have processed your, your, your usage and you have formatted according to the code of practice, you can practically use this API to actually share them. It doesn't matter how big your report is, we have a, a actually made available capabilities so that you can send a massive usage reports and we can process them and make them available. We also have plans in the near future to actually not only accept the, the, the standard uh, format that we use in the Make Data Account project, but also other content compliant pro, pro formats. And so that this, repos this repository of usage data keep, uh, keeps growing and is available to everybody. So we can all uh, share uh, this usage data and make it comparable. In the next step of building this infrastructure, I want to use, and uh, talking about consuming, um, consu consuming usage, I just want to make a parenthesis to talk about a little bit of a service that we use actually for consuming, and that's the event data service uh, from DataSite and Crossref. This is practically uh, the main component of a financial infrastructure, and this is a service between DataSite and Crossref 
uh, event data as a service that provides connections these are, uh, between persistent identifiers and other resources. Uh, and it was actually built uh, with the focus on social media and data citations. But in the main data account project and with all these uh, uh, if all, all this effort that we are doing towards uh, sharing usage, we are using event data as the main place to actually allow user, allow repositories and every anybody out there to consume usage data. Having this in a centralized way, like uh, all the usage there actually help us uh, to eliminate silos and improve the information flow and reduce complexity as well because it provides a single place to retrieve usage citations, not only usage. It also eliminates a lot of work with repository because I will show you some of the features that we have there that will help you to consume usage in a better way. So every time that you are sharing data usage reports with data site, we push all that usage uh, to the event data service. And we may make it available uh, for, for everybody to access it from, in the same way that you will access citations from that service. We also have coupled that with a, a, a few uh, very, very useful aggregations. You can aggregate um, all uh, usage and citations by researcher, funder, and also repository or data center. And actually, I want to show you an example of how would that be. One, one interesting example, I'm not going to show the three of them, but I would want to show you how a researcher can actually retrieve um, a researcher that probably would like to know how their data is shared, accessed. And what they have, and in the world of PIDs, we identify researchers with ORCIDs, and, and they also part, are part of the event data service. So we're using a variety of methods, we get ORCIDs to event data. And these are connected to all the data sets of the researcher and in place to all the data usage reports. And therefore you can query things like um, how many citations and usage do my profile, my, my data sets have. And here I put an example of Julia Davis from University of California, San Francisco, and how she can, with only her ORCID ID, can go to the event data service and obtain all the links to all the data sets and in place get all the usage from those, the, or those reports that you have submitted as a repository and extract all the usage as well from, the, from those ones. In a similar fashion, you can do this with uh, the other use cases, as I mentioned, but I'm not going to mention this, but there's tons of documentation in our website and you can see how to use the data service to actually consume this in a useful way in your repository. The last piece of infrastructure that I want to talk about is about displaying usage data. And we actually, um, we are using event data for this as well, but to, uh, to extract all the data, and we are putting it in, in a few places. First of all, we are, putting, we are displaying this in dataset search, and we use uh, terms such as views and downloads, which is, um, simil, uh, which is a human readable vocabulary for this, the, hum, the language that is in the code of practice, but uh, we find them more accessible and, and we will, you will see, you go to search and, and you will see that some of, of the resources that have usage and that, uh, have views and download there is because it's coming directly from repositories that have been sharing that data there. We not only show the counts, but also we actually show you how can you show the distribution of how usage has been coming and being reported over the time. And we have actually plans to display citations here as well and to actually display DUI resolution counts which is something that we will be working in the near future. Now, not everybody displays views and downloads of usage in this way. There are many other ways. And I want to show you a few other implementations that how they are using, using event data and all the services that we have, all the infrastructure we have provided. Here, first of all, I have the Dash repository. This is from the University of California. And you will see on the, on the, on the, right, uh, on the, on the right side how they have like a box for metrics and, and, and specifically DUI, uh, views and downloads. Another example would be, um, I'm not sure if, yeah, sorry. Another example would be data one, and they actually aggregate usage by the whole, by something that they call uh, member nodes, which is a big, 
uh, networks of, of, of repositories and, and they, they, this, they actually make a visualization of how, may, how much use downloads and views have, the, have these non-member nodes over, over a period of time. So, and using the exactly same services, everything processed according to the code of practice and actually displayed in a different way. And the last example that I want to show you is Senodo. They actually, actually, they are displaying views and downloads directly into the, all the interfaces. So if, if today you go to Senodo to any of the resources that are out there, you probably can see those. Two. And those, those uh, views and downloads are actually processed according to the code of practice. So this is some of the stuff that we have been building. Um, I think in the next section, we are going to discuss a little bit about what can you do next. And I think I'm going to hand over to Robin for that. Robin? Yes, thank you. Um, let's see, and I think you're clicking through for us, right? Yes, okay, good, okay. So yes, uh, Helena's told you a little bit about um, the Make Data Count project and why this was important, and Christian's told you a little bit about what uh, Data Site and the other Make Data Count uh, partners have done so far. And so the question then for you guys is, you know, what do I do now, you might be wondering. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about the actual concrete steps you can take to start uh, making data count at your institution um, using some of the, the resources and services that we have come up with. So next slide, please. Okay, so let's say you want to contribute usage stats. There's a couple of steps to this. So step one, as uh, Christian alluded to, is you should process your logs according to the counter code of practice. Um, and so you can, there's a link here to see the counter code of practice for research data, particularly um, at the project counter website. Uh, there are also codes of practice for other things that are not research data, but make data count was specifically concerned with this particular code of practice. Um, and as Christian mentioned, you can process your logs um, in a number of ways technically, as long as they meet through these requirements that are put out by the counter code of practice. Um, if you need some help with that or need to see an example of a, a tool that might help process these statistics, then you can look at this uh, tool that CDL has developed. Uh, and there's a link there for the uh, GitHub repo uh, where that lives. Um, and technically, you could just stop here if you wanted and display these things in your own repository. Um, but step two, which we, of course, would be interested in you doing, is submitting your logs to data site using our usage reports API. Um, and this way they can go to a, to a central place and this enables some of the more interesting um, queries that Christian mentioned where, for instance, a researcher could, you know, uh, look up themselves in event data and then see their usage um, from various repositories included along with their citations and this kind of thing. So we like the idea of having this stuff in a central place. Um, and there's a link here to tell you how to use our usage, AP, uh, usage reports API to submit those logs to us. Um, and we have a full guide at the a link on the very bottom that tells you a little bit more about um, uh, contributing usage stats and consuming usage stats that come out. Okay, next slide. So let's say you want to contribute citations. Um, as far as data site is concerned, um, if, you if you include related identifiers in the DOI metadata that you submit to us, and I have an example here of how you might do that for a particular related identifier um, within the metadata blob that you sent us, um, then we will include this information in the event data service that Christian mentioned. So if, as long as you're putting in uh, related identifiers with their relation types, uh, then we will send that information to event data and it will be there to be retrieved. Um, you can't yet add related identifiers in Fabrica. Um, this is through our form anyway. This is something that will uh, come, come soon. Um, we are going to eventually make it so you can add um, all of the relevant fields via the Fabrica form and related identifiers will be one of them and that's a big request that people have sent us. Um, it, there is a long list of different relation types that you can submit when you submit related identifiers um, and this is all listed out in our schema documentation and you can find the latest version of that at schema.datasite.org and this will tell you all the different uh, available relations and give you some examples of um, uh, some examples and explanation of what those different relation types actually mean. Okay, so that was a little bit about contributing these things. Let's say that you want to now display them in some way. So in this case, if you want to display views and downloads, step one, of course, is retrieving the usage information that you actually want to, that you want to get. Um, and as mentioned, you can retrieve uh, usage events from data sites event data API. Uh, this is just uh, part of our own REST API with its own separate endpoint, the slash events. Um, and we have a guide that will explain to you what the different available categories of usage events are according to the counter code of practice um, and let you know how you can actually query for those. 
And so once you've retrieved the information that you want, then step two, of course, is displaying that relevant usage information on your website. Um, as Christian mentioned in his part of the presentation, data site has, uses the more user-friendly terms views and downloads, um, as do the other Make Data Count partners and most of the people that we've seen. Um, so you can see what that looks like in data site search, or you can look at the examples that, that Christian uh, provided from some of the other, uh, other partners and the people who've done this stuff. And we do also, uh, in our support documents, we have a full use case for CDL's experience of implementing the counter code of practice. And you can see um, their kind of rationale and a little bit of, um, it'll discuss a little bit more about how they decided to do certain things that they, that they chose to do. Um, and okay, next slide, please. So let's say you want to display citations. Um, so again, this is, follows a very similar pattern to the usage, uh, the usage statistics. So again, you can retrieve the citation or other relation information that you want. Um, in the event data API, again, which is part of our REST API with its own endpoint, um, this is where all of your related identifier information goes. And we call these relational events, we call these linking events, the ones that link a particular data site DOIs to other things, like other Crossref DOIs, other data site DOIs, this kind of stuff. Um, and so the event data guide that we have will explain uh, what the different available categories of linking events are. Um, but again, these just come from the, um, the relation types that are in our uh, data site metadata schema. And so you can also view the full schema documentation to see what those might be, um, to see what you want to retrieve. And then of course, again, step two is display the relevant information on your website. Um, one note of caution with this, with the uh, citation information and the relation information that we have, is that there are multiple relation types that you can use to describe a related identifier. And depending on um, kind of what you're talking about or how your particular data repository operates, there could be multiple relation types that could describe uh, what you might consider to be a citation. Um, and we do leave the choice of relation type up to the submitting repository. So you may need to um, have a bit of caution when you count to see uh, what other people include and what kind of numbers you're, you're getting from this. Because um, for instance, we have, um, something A can, ref can reference B, A can also cite B, and there's supplements and there's all kinds of other things. So the, the world of data citation is a little bit muddy in terms of what it actually means. And so you'll want to explore some of those relation types and see, see what it is that you're actually trying to describe when you're putting out these kinds of information. And step three for bonus points uh, is we now just very recently have, re have released our GraphQL API as a pre-release version. This means it's not quite ready for prime time just yet, but you are, you are able to try it out and, and see um, what it does for you and, and give that a shot. Um, but it will be changing over the course of time. It's sort of a, a beta, uh, not quite released version just as of yet. But this way you can have a little more fun with data relations. Uh, the GraphQL stuff is not a part of the make data count work. It's not something we did as part of that project. It's a part of a, another project we're in called Freya. Um, but this is something that is, could be interesting for other people to see what other kinds of relations are available. Um, because again, this information comes from the type of metadata you would submit, um, like these related identifiers. Okay, and that's all for my part. So now I'll turn it over to Martin to talk about the future and where does data site go from here? Thank you, Robin. So my name is Martin Ferner. I'm the data site technical director and next 15 minutes or so I will talk about what is left to do. So um, yeah, thanks for advancing the slides for me. Um, like every project, including make data count. Uh, we did a lot of great things, but of course there's still work left. And I listed some of the things here on this slide and I will go in more detail uh, uh, with most of these things. So the first one is really that data repositories have started to um, do the log process and send you the stats. But as Christian has shown, this is at a very early stage. There are a few data repositories that are doing that. And uh, I will go in more detail in a moment. Uh, we should think about how can we increase adoption of user stats? How can we make it easier for data repositories to implement all these things that we talked about? If you're not in a grant funded project and have extra resources, et cetera. From the citation perspective, what is left to do is mostly for publishers. So when you look, look at the data citation information that's sent by data repositories and publishers, you see that the data repositories that are members of data site 
work with data site DUIs. For the most part, they're doing a great job. We have about a million data citations linking to publications from CrossF members. In the other direction, the numbers are much, much smaller. So there's obviously work to do there. And that's something that I will not go in more detail because that's a little bit out of scope for data site, but just suffice to say that we are working very closely with CrossF on this, in particular Helena, and happy to go in more detail here in the discussion. For data site, uh, there is additional work to do finding data citations in other places. There's additional work to do with regards to aggregation and um, Christian touched on this already. Um, also, we have talked about citations and usage statistic in this um, presentation, and that was the work we were focusing on in the Make Data Count project. But there are other kinds of data around um, data sets, in particular altmetrics. And finally, um, we have been talking mostly about infrastructure so far, but where we really want to get to is, is data metrics and there's work to do. And I will talk a little bit about what the next steps are there. So the next slide, um, you, I will talk a little bit about usage stats and why its um, adoption is still at a very early stage. Collecting usage stats is not trivial. Um, log processing, in a standard way, generating reports and all this is quite resource intensive. And if you're not a large data repository with lots of resources, that might be something that uh, is, looks a little bit scary. So we have been starting to think about providing this as a service, as data site for our members. And obviously, um, that's not something that others haven't talked about before and sort of the closest to this is very successfully happening in the United Kingdom with Iris UK, which sort of provides a centralized service that basically every UK university takes part of um, generating counter compliant reports for text documents hosted in institutional repositories. Uh, they have started to work on data metrics as well. And um, what we would be implementing if we do that, and um, we had early planning stages for that, would be quite similar to that. The service works not by processing log files, but by um, using a token that's embedded in web pages, which works similarly to how web tracking services like Google Analytics and Matomo work. The big challenge in this is obviously privacy, in particular if you cross borders of countries and maybe also move inside and outside the European Union with particular privacy rules since last year. Etc. And that's hopefully there is a little bit of discussion around this slide, and that's definitely something we will be working on going forward in the next few months. In the next slide, I will uh, talk about additional sources for data citation, um, which is primarily uh, two things. One is to look at data sets with data site DUIs that are cited in publications that don't have crossref DUIs. And one example for some communities is preprints by archive. Uh, but of course, there are lots of text documents that, that don't use DUIs, and we should think about how we can collect those citations. And then um, citations might not always be put in metadata, and the best approach to find those is text mining, which usually if it requires a license to have access to the full text. Uh, the Europe PubMed Central is doing this for life sciences for the open access corpus there. And that's something we have looked at. Uh, there, is, uh, additional, they, uh, there are additional data citations that we can include uh, that don't appear in reference list. And obviously this is focused on life sciences, but uh, we can do similar approaches with other disciplines and with, also with partners um, that do this text mining already. The next slide, um, I will talk a little bit about aggregations. Basically, uh, Christian has sort of introduced you to the concept already. We are doing this already, but uh, we want to make this much easier. And 
that's basically work we're doing right now in the EC funded prayer project that was mentioned before. And we call this the PIT graph. And in the next slide, you see an example of a PIT graph, um, which looks super complicated, but it's basically all the connections, um, starting with a single researcher, what are all of his or her publications in this case, not data sets, and what in turn is sort of referenced by these publications. Um, this is work that is at a fairly early stage, but this will allow us to do very sophisticated aggregations. And um, you can expect to do much more in a few months on this. Finally, uh, altmetrics. That's something that is used a lot for journal articles and other text publications, but nobody is really doing this for research data. That's mainly because in the surveys that we and others have done in previous years, there wasn't so much of an interest. But what we haven't done is sort of revisit this, whether this has changed since uh, we did the survey a few years ago. Um, and also this might be that for specific disciplines, for specific kinds of data, there is a lot of altmetrics that's interesting to capture and expose. Um, and this could not just be tweets, but it could also be Wikipedia and other uh, kinds of altmetrics that uh, could provide useful information. Event data, as Christian mentioned, is a collaboration of Crossref, and Crossref has built a lot of infrastructure around tracking these kinds of um, information already. So it would be relatively straightforward to expand this to research data. And that's something that we definitely want to do. It just hasn't been a top priority because we felt the citation use that's are more important, but that's something that definitely will happen. Next, um, and these are my final two slides. We want to move beyond building infrastructure. What we're really interested in is data metrics and data site can contribute to that. Um, we think that data metrics is something that is not there yet, but that we are on a good path. We are sort of in the second stage. The first stage is really, and we all have worked really hard on this for many years. First stage is to building community agreement and research data and data citations are critical for scholarship. In many cases, we could say that we have achieved that. There's still lots of work to do, but then we and others have worked to the second step, which is building infrastructure to collect these citations and use that. And um, as we presented today, we have made good progress there. There's lots of work to do um, with adoption, for example, for use stats, but we have started to think about what comes next. And that is sort of moving towards data metrics. And as a first step, sort of as a, one of the final things we do, the Make Data Count project uh, is starting to reach out closer to the bibliometrics community and uh, work with them on what is needed for data metrics. And we have already planned a mini workshop as part of a bigger bibliometric conference uh, in a few months. And on the next and final slide, um, I list some of the things we, we have to think about and consider as we start to develop these data metrics together with the bibliometrics community and, and the broader uh, research community that, um, Metrics for journal articles are widely used, but not everything there is perfect and there are issues. And we should learn from that and not repeat some of the mistakes made. For example, that you use uh, the journal where the article was published as a proxy for impact. And that, of course, we want to try to avoid that. And for example, say the data set is not important, but the repository where the data set was sort of published and hosted. Um, initiatives like DORA um, stress sort of the best practices for responsible metrics. And we have started to talk to these communities and we should work closer with them that we basically, uh, when we move toward data metrics, that this is not something that uh, 
relies, for example, on a signal number and that there are sort of arbitrary boundaries that a metric above 10 is great. And if it's 9.9, .9, it's not. This sounds silly, but this is what actually happening, as many of you know, with, with uh, some of the journal metrics that I currently use. And finally, uh, we want this to remain a community effort that's not locked behind uh, paywalls and commercial providers um, so far for data citations and use stats. We are on a very good path with, for example, uh, the Scolix effort at RDA that many organizations are participating in and everybody can contribute and consume this information and we hope it stays like this. And with that, I hand back to Helena and uh, we can hopefully answer some questions. Well, thanks a lot, all three of you, for this great overview. Um, there was a lot of information in there, um, but we still have time for a couple of questions for all three speakers. Um, you can use the Q&A button, or you can also use the chat if that's easier. Uh, we already have a couple of questions. Um, so the first question is, you mentioned that this was already a second MDC project. Does that mean there could also be a third one? I don't know who wants to, to take that question. Uh, I, can, um, I can answer that. Um, yes, that's something that the project partners are discussing. Nothing is um, set in stone or even submitted. It's clear from the presentation today that there's both a lot of work left to do, in particular with adoption, um, but also that there's still a way to go to move from infrastructure to data metrics. So definitely something that we want to move forward and something where we hope we can convince a funder to help us with that. Okay, great. Um, yeah, and I think the next question is probably also for you. So who, would decide when these numbers are ready to be used as data metrics? That's a very good question and I don't think there's an easy answer. I think the short answer is if you look at metrics for other scholarly content, you have to be patient. So this sort of the time from starting to reliably track uh, for example citation counts to when we started thinking about as indicators or metrics, that's more in the order of 25 years. And hopefully this goes faster with data metrics, but just the fact that you can start to count something and there's still a lot of work to do, doesn't mean it's metrics. Uh, the first step is obviously that we can trust these numbers. And for that, we have to count this sort of for, for a little bit longer than what we're doing now, maybe also independently by different uh, organizations. Um, and then the second part is just a lot of, so aside from the technical and data part, there needs to be a lot of community agreement. So simple answers like is 10 data citations of something more meaningful than eight or what is a good number or what do you, how do you manage the difference between disciplines where the citation culture, the data citation culture is very different. So does a count of five data citations in social sciences be the same as in life sciences and most likely not, etc. cetera. So uh, because we know that uh, impact assessment and metrics have a huge um, effect on how we all work as scholars, we should just be careful and sort of do one step after the next and not jump ahead of ourselves and say we have data metrics and just use these numbers how you feel fit. I think we will get there, but it's just a path that has, a, has more steps left before we can say we have data metrics. Okay, so I see a couple of implementation uh, questions. Um, so let me start with one from the Q&A. As an Irish UK contributor, it would be preferable if all data from our repository could be in one place for analysis and benchmarking rather than data metrics in data site and publication metrics in Irish UK. Forgive me if I misunderstood. So I think, yeah, there might be a misunderstanding. So I don't know if, who wants to take this question. Uh, if it's okay, Christian, I'll try to answer that. Um, uh, we have worked with Iris UK from the beginning, mainly because they are also very involved in the 
counter initiative and sort of when we wrote a code of practice. What is clear is that Iris UK is sharing this information with others. So for example, open air is also reusing that. So it's not an either or situation, but that um, if Iris UK and Repository do all this work, that it would be nice if we can also sh show this uh, in data side infrastructure for, for example, um, if it goes via the event data service, it's, it's very easy to combine citations and uh, use stats in one API in, in, in and in a data site search, etc. So there is no decision to be made to do one or the other. It's really more about uh, exposing this information as widely as possible. And of course, that's up to the data repository whether or not uh, that is something they want to do or whether they want to sort of keep the information in Iris UK. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Um, and then in chat, there's a question, are there plans for institutional repositories like DSpace to include the needed functionality? I don't know if Robin or Christian wants to take that. I, don't, um, I mean, when it comes to, for example, consuming the user data, I think it's something that uh, we have not discussed with other repositories. I'm not sure if Robin knows about that. But with regards to um, uh, providing usage, um, I think this is uh, usage mostly uh, providing the, the the usage of the reporting of that something that whatever the wh whoever is collecting the the logs does the the part the organization that should be providing the functionality. Um, via space, as, as I understand, you will install it and and, and you will have. Uh, all those logs there. Um, maybe it could be that uh, they could work and actually make it easy, that process easier. Uh, but that we are not. Sh I'm not sure if they have plans of that at the moment. Uh, can I add two? Yeah. Uh, two things. One is um, that um, open repositories is just around the corner. It's uh, less than two weeks away, and that's uh, of course a great opportunity. Uh, to discuss some of these things in detail there. Uh, we have already had talked to the DSpace folks a little bit. Um, the other aspects is one of the challenges that we saw is that many repositories are not either data or text documents. And a good example is um, Zenodo that has implemented our code of practice and that um, Right now, the log processing is about 90% the same for text and data documents with the differences that Chris had described early on. So we should figure out how we can make this easier for, uh, for example, institutional repositories that host data and publications sort of to do log processing in a standard way that it's sort of both uh, conforming to the code of practice for research data, but also to the sort of um, counter code of practice for publications, either the most recent release five or the many people to use the release four, so that the processing is the same and that the report generation has some differences because they are slightly different things. And that is, is of course something that needs a little bit of work on the DSpace side, but that's probably 90% um, of the work has already been done because these reports are very similar. Okay, thanks. And then I think we have a last question probably for Robin. Um, if my developers want to start implementing, is there one place where they can find all the technical documentation to do this? Yes, so we have on our support site, a, uh, we've recently changed it up a little bit. And so we have a new section just for uh, usage and citations. And I believe that was um, the one of the links that was on the uh, slides in the section that I was doing where I said, you know, read more, uh, read more about this in detail. Um, so we will be sharing those slides uh, with everybody. And so then you can actually click on the links and all of this. But yes, in our in our support site, there is a, a usage and citations place that will link you to all the appropriate documentation. Okay, great. Then thanks again to all three speakers and also thanks to all the people who joined today and asked great questions. Um, as I said, we'll be making the recording available to our YouTube channel. 
and uh, there will be a webinar next month where we'll be discussing the pit graph. So we hope to uh, see you again next month. Thank you.